tonight has in life played many parts. Here we have Barman, Pika, or possibly a gully dwarf, Bapu. Here we have the dark wizard, Graceman, and his twin brother, Karaman, a mighty warrior. Pika tonight is played by Larry Hickman, Karaman and Graceman by Terry Phillips. Ah, Flint, Stout Gore, or possibly Riverwind, Plainsman. And here, possibly, Princess of the Plain, Goldmoon, or a faithful, tender handler named Tassilpop. Here we have Doug Nile and Janet
Thus began the age of despair. The roads were tangled. The winds and the sandstorms dwelt in the hospice cities. The plains and mountains became our home. As the old gods lost their power, we called to the blank sky into the cold dividing gray to the ears of new gods. The sky is calm, silent, unmoving. We had yet to hear their answer. Into this world of crin do we now enter, who is to say if the dream be phantoms, or if we be but phantoms in the dream's reality. We shall drift into and out of the tale as wind moving through the trees. We stop only here and there to catch an understanding of the tale, as we stop here with the great quest and its roots. Lynn Fireforge collapsed on a moss-covered boulder. His old dwarven bones had supported him long enough and were unwilling to continue without complaint. Long years of wandering had forced the dwarf into the habit of talking to himself. I should never have left. And I'll be damned if I never leave it again. Warmed by the afternoon sun, the boulder felt comfortable to the ancient dwarf who had been walking all day in the chill autumn air. He looked around him, his eyes lingering fondly over the familiar landscape. The valleywood trees in the valley were ablaze in the season's colors, the brilliant reds and golds fading into the purple of the corolla peaks beyond. Thin columns of smoke curled among the treetops, the only sign to mark the location of Solus. A soft spreading haze blanketed the veil with a sweet aroma of home fires burning. My own home fire's gone up. My house has been sitting empty. Roof probably leaked and ruined the furniture. Stupid quest. Silliest thing I ever did. After 148 years, I ought to learn. Huh, you'll never learn, Gorp. Not if you live to be 248. Tannis? The same. Well, you've learned no manners in five years. Still no respect for my age or my station. I hope no one knows a sauce. I doubt there'd be many who'd remember. Time doesn't pass for you and me, old Gorp, as it does for humans. Five years is a long time for them, though, but a few moments for us. You haven't changed. The same can't be said of yourself. Why the beard? You were ugly enough. I've been in the lands that were not friendly to those of elven blood. The beard? A gift from my human father did much to hide my heritage. By the way, did you find what you sought? Some sign of the true gods or peace of mind? I went seeking both. Which do you mean? Well, I assume one would go with the other. So you found nothing. Nothing. As we discovered long ago, the only clerics and priests in this world serve false gods. I heard tales of healing and magic. Fortunately, our friend Raceland taught me what to watch out for. Raceland, that pasty-faced, skinny magician? He's more than half Charlotte himself. Always sniffing and whining and poking his nose where it doesn't belong. And if it weren't for his twin brother looking out for, out for him, someone would have put an end to his magic long ago. I think the young man was a better magician than you give him credit for. And you must admit, you worked long and tirelessly, tirelessly to help those who were taken in by these fake clerics, as I did. For which you got little thanks, no doubt. Very little. People want to believe in something, even if deep inside they know it's false. What? Who goes there? The only answer for long moments was an eerie sound that made the hair rise on the half elf's neck. It was a hollow whirring sound that started out low, then grew higher and higher, and eventually attained a high-pitched screaming whine. Soaring with it came a voice. Elven wanderer, turn from your horse and leave that dwarf behind. We are the spirits of those poor souls Flint Fireforge left on the barroom floor. Did we die of combat? No, we died of shame, cursed by the ghost of the grape for not being able to outdrink a hill dwarf. That is burst out laughing. Flint's beard was quivering with rage, and the half elf was forced to lay a hand on his shoulder to keep the angry dwarf from charging headlong into the brush. Wouldn't you know it? Tasselhoff burp. The same? Flint! The candidate threw his arms around the dwarf and hugged him. Flint, embarrassed. Returned the embrace somewhat reluctantly, then quickly stepped back. Tasselhoff grinned. He looked up at the half elf. Who's this? Janice! I didn't recognize you, Mr. Beard. He 
held out his short arm. Oh, no thanks. I want to keep my pouch. You rascal! <laughs> we leave the dwarf searching for his purse and find him and his companions some time later. Here now is a tavern, cradled high in the bowels of the mighty Valenwood trees. <coughs> the Inn of the Last Home is renowned in all Abyssinian for its warmth and comfort in times of trial and trouble. Here did Flint, Tannis, and Tasselhoff the Kender meet again with the companions. It had been their vow that after five years they would join again for one final adventure. Here awaiting them was Caraman, a mighty warrior, and his twin brother Raceman, dark and light sized in the same form. Raceman was a wizard of undeniable talent, though the dark depths of his soul no one could form. Where's Raceman? There. But Tannis, he's changed. Tannis felt a sudden reluctance to speak the young Maj alone. Raceland? The robed figure looked up slowly. The half-elf stuck in his breath in horror. The face that turned toward him from the shadows of the hood was a face out of a nightmare. The mage's white skin had turned a golden color, but it was the man's eyes that arrested Tanis and held him pinned in their terrible gaze. For the eyes were no longer the eyes of any, any living human Tanis had ever seen. The black pupils were now the shape of hourglasses. And so, I see time, and it affects all things. Even as I look at you now, Tannis, I see you die slowly by inches. And so I see every living thing. But I have power now. The day will come, they told me, when my strength would shape the world. Then sat down next to Tannis. The half elf turned thankfully away from the mage as the dwarf called for. Ale! Where is that kinder? I suppose he stole the bargain. Here we are! A red haired young girl loomed behind him, carrying a tray full of mud. Caraman looked up at the girl and grinned. Now, Tennis, guess who this is? <laughs> you two flint. If you win, I'll buy the rob. Tennis stared at the laughing girl. Red hair curled around her face, her green eyes danced with the sun, freckles lightly smattered across her nose and cheeks. Tennis seemed to remember the eyes, but beyond that, he was blank. Mm, I give up. But then humans change so rapidly to the eyes of elves that we lose track. I'm 102, yet seem no more than 30 to you. And to me, those 100 years seem as 30. This young woman must have been a child when we left. I was 14, and Cameron used to say I was so ugly, my father would have to pay someone to marry me. Cheetah! Out. You're buying your cradle! No fair! She gave you a clue! Well, the years have proved him wrong. I've traveled many roads, and you're one of the prettiest girls I've seen in Grin. I know. <laughs> well, here's the night of Salamia! Stop! A straight-backed figure dressed in full armor and chainmail stood in the door. A great many people in the inn turned to stare at the knight and the bright armor that he wore, with its symbol of the Order of the Road. <coughs> It was unusual enough to see a knight in full armor enter the inn in these days of peace. It was still more unusual to see a knight in full armor that dated back practically to the cataclysm. Stern carefully smoothed his great thick mustache, which was as obsolete as his armor, being the ages old symbols of the knight. The knight was holding the door open for a tall man and woman, heavily cloaked in furs. It seemed that the woman spoke a word of thanks to Stern, for he bowed to her in a courtly, old-fashioned manner, long dead in the modern world. Look at that. The gallant knight helps the lady fair. I wonder where he dragged those two up. Barbarian spoon planes, it looks like. That's the dress of the way she tried. I should know. My parents lived near the village for a while. Until they were run off. Apparently, the two plainsmen declined any offer Sir might have made, so the knight bowed again and left them, making his way through the crowd to his friends. Sturm walked through the inn with a proud and noble air, such as he might have worn while walking forward to receive his knighthood from the king. So, Tannis, you've grown a beard. <laughs> what are your relatives, Sturm? Did you find your father? Oh, I heard rumors. Some said my father was dead. Some <coughs> say he lives, but no one knows where he is. Your inheritance? Ah, uh, I carry it. Tannis looked down to see that the knight wore a splendid, if old-fashioned, two-handed sword. Caraman stood up to peer over the table. That's a beauty. They don't make them like that now. My last sword broke in a fight with an ogre. I had to wring the creature's neck. Ferris Ironfell put a new blade on it today, but uh, it 
cost me dear. According to the legend, this sword will break only if I do. It was all that was left of my father's estate after the debtors finished with it, and I had to argue some with them to get this. I can imagine. Are there any still left alive? Who are those people? The barbarians were walking past their table, heading for two empty chairs that sat in the shadows in a corner near the fire pit. The friends looked at them curiously. The man was the tallest man Tannis had ever seen. Caraman, at six foot, would come only to this man's shoulder. The caraman's chest was probably twice as round, his arms three times as big. Although the man was bundled with the first barbarian tribes that lived in, it was obvious that he was thin for his great height. His face, though dark-skinned, had the pale cast of one who has been ill or suffered greatly. His companion, the woman Sturm had bowed to, was so muffled in a fur-trimmed cape and hood that it was difficult to tell much about her. Neither she nor her tall escort glanced at Sturm as they passed. The woman carried a plain staff trimmed with feathers in barbaric fashion. The man carried a well-worn knapsack. They sat down in the chairs, huddled in their clothes, and talked together in low voices. I found them wandering around on the road outside of town. The woman near exhaustion, the man just as bad. I brought them here, told them they could get food and rest for the night. <laughs> they are proud people and would have refused my help, I think. But they were lost and tired. And there are things on the road it is better not to face in the dark these days. The secret guard questioned me about a step, the blue crystal or some such a thing. One of the slimy guards stopped us. They were going to impound Grace's staff, if you'll believe that, for further investigation. I rattled my sword at them and they thought better of the notion. What would have happened had they taken it? They would have died. I wonder what's so important about a blue crystal staff that has the hobgoblins threatening to kill people. There are rumors of worse than that. Armies are gathering in the north. Armies of strange creatures, not human. There is talk of war. But who, what? I've heard the same myself. So have I. In fact, I heard. Castle Hop yawned and turned away. Easily bored, the camper looked around the inn for some new amusement. His eyes went to an old man spinning tales for a child by the fire. The old man had a larger audience now in passing of it. The two barbarians were listening. The woman had thrown her hood back. The firelight shone on her hair. The kenders stared in admiration. The woman's face was like the face of a marble statue, classic, pure, cold. But it was her hair that captured the kenders' attention. Tass had never seen such hair before, especially on a dark-haired, dark-skinned plainsman. No jeweler spinning molten strands of silver and of gold could have created the effect of this woman's silver gold hair shimmering in the firelight. The woman was listening intently to the old man's story. But one other person listened to the old man. This was a man dressed in the official robes of a seeker. He sat at a small round table drinking mulled wine. Several mugs stood empty before him, and even as the kender watched, he called sourly for another. Wine! <gasps> That's Hedger, the high seeker. Tika bustled over to help him. He snarled at her, mentioning poor service. She seemed to start to answer sharply, then bit her lip and kept silent. The old man came to an end of his tale, the boy sighed. Are your stories true, old one? The stories of the ancient gods? Tasselhoff saw the high seeker frown. The kinder hoped he wouldn't bother the old man. Tass touched Tass's arm to catch his attention, nodding his head toward the seeker with a look which meant there might be trouble. The friends turned. All were immediately overwhelmed by the incomparable beauty of the plains woman. They stared in silence. The old man's voice carried clearly over the drone of the other conversation in the common room. Indeed, my stories are true, child. You ask these two, do they carry such stories in their hearts? Do you? Can you tell me a story? I'm sorry. I'm not a teller of tales. I, I have not. You heard. are not a teller of tales, but you are a singer of songs, aren't you, chieftain's daughter? Sing this, child, your song, Gold Moon. You know the one. From out of nowhere, apparently, a lute appeared in the old man's hand. He gave it to the woman who was staring at him in fear and astonishment. How do you know me, sir? That is not important. Sing for us, chieftain's daughter. The woman took the lute with hands that trembled visibly. 
Her companion seemed to make a whispered protest, but she did not hear him. Her eyes were held fast by the glittering black eyes of the old man. Slowly, hesitantly, she began to strum the loop. As the melancholy chorus drifted through the common room, the conversation ceased. Soon, everyone was watching the beautiful woman, but she did not notice. She sang with the old man alone. Wandered and wandered until he despaired because he thought he would never see his 
his homeland again. He prayed to Paladine for help, and suddenly there appeared before him a white stag. Did he shoot it? Oh, he started to, but his heart failed him. He could not shoot an animal so magnificent. The stag bounded away, then it stopped and looked back at him. Kuma began to follow it. Day and night he followed the animal, and soon he found his homeland. He offered thanks to the god Paladine. Blasphemy! Blasphemy! Heretic! Corrupted our youth! I'll bring you before the council, old man. Call the guard someone. Uh, have them arrest this, this man and, and this woman for singing lewd song. Obviously a witch. I'll take that staff. The high speaker lurched across the floor as he spoke. He came to stand before the barbarian woman who was staring at him in disgust. He reached for her staff. No, that is mine. Which I am the high seeker. I take what I want. He started to make a grab for the staff. The woman's tall companion rose to his feet. The chieftain's daughter says you will not take it. He shoved the man backward. The tall man's push was not rough, but it knocked the drunken speaker completely off balance. His arms flailing wildly, he tried to catch himself. He lurched forward too far, tripped over his official robes, and to the horror of the watching crowd, fell head first into the roaring fire. There was a whoosh and a flare of light, a sickening smell of burning flesh. Hedrick screamed tore through the stunned silence. Then the crazed man leaped to his feet and started whirling around in a frenzy. He had become a living torch. Tannis and the others sat, unable to move, paralyzed with the shock of the incident. Only Tasselhoff had wits enough to run forward, anxious to try and help the man. But the speaker was screaming and waving his arms, spanning the flames that were consuming his clothes and his body. There seemed no way to help him. Then the old man grabbed the barbarian's feather-decorated staff and handed it to the kender. Here, knock him down. Then we can smother the fire. Tasselhoff took the staff. He swung it, using all his strength, oh. and hit Hedery squarely in the chest. The man fell to the ground. Oh. Tasselhoff himself stood, mouth open. Staff clutched in his hand, staring down at the amazing sight at his feet. The flames had died instantly. The man's robes were whole, undamaged. His skin was pink and healthy. He sat up, a look of awe on his face. He stared down at his hands and his robes. There was not a mark on his skin. There was not the smallest finger smoking on his robes. You him. It's a miracle, oh, paradise, a miracle. The staff! Look at the staff! Tasselhoff's eyes went to the staff in his hand. He noticed that it was made of blue crystal, and it was glowing with a bright blue light. The old man began shouting, Call the guards! Arrest the kinder! Arrest the barbarians! Arrest their friends! I saw them come in with this knight! What are you crazy, old man? Call the guards! The word spread. <laughs> the speaker staggered to his feet, his face pale, blotched with red. The barbarian woman and her companion stood up, fear and alarm in their faces. Father witch, you have jarred me with evil. Even as I burn to purify my flesh, you will burn to purify your soul. With that, Hedrick reached out and before anyone could stop him, plunged his hand back into the flame. He gagged with the pain, but did not cry out. Then, clutching his charred and blackened hand, he turned and staggered off through the murmuring crowd. You've got to get out of here. The whole town is been hunting for that staff. Strange men called the thinker that they destroy Sola if they caught someone with it. The townspeople will turn you over to guard immediately. But it's not our staff. Hannah glared at the old man and saw him settle back into his chair, a pleased smile on his face. The old man grinned at Hannah and winked. Do you think they'll believe you? Look at them! Hannah looked. People were glaring at them. Some picked up mugs. He saw the flash of steel being drawn. Shots from down below indicated the guards were coming. We'll have to go out through the kitchen. Yes, we won't look there yet, but hurry! It won't take the long to surround the place! Hannah turned to his friends. 
Years of being apart had not ruined their ability to react as a team. Harriman had pulled on his shining helm, drawn his sword, shouldered his pack, and was helping his brother to his feet. Raceland had his staff in his hands and was moving around the table. Flint had hold of his battle axe and was frowning darkly at the onlookers, who seemed hesitant about rushing in to attack such well-armed men. Only Sturm sat, calmly drinking his ale. Sturm, come on! We've got to get out of here! What? Run from this rabble? He's a religious fanatic, Sturm. <laughs> we'll probably burn us at the stake. And there's a lady to protect. Sturm stood up at once. <laughs> <laughs> the dream flows beneath us with battles and flight, fear and hope. The purpose of the hero's quest becomes clear to them, and they set out east to find the greatest gift ever given to man. Often the dream runs brightly, as wonders and beauties abound. Yet all too often, the dream turns shadow and dark, as the eastbound heroes found Gold Moon's home. Of which. Twilight. Pale sunset. Shafts of yellow and tan streak the western sky and fade into dreary night. My companions sit huddled around a fire that offers no warmth, for there exists no flame on print that will drive the chill from their souls. They do not speak to each other, but each sits staring into the fire, trying to make some sense of what they have seen, trying to make sense of the senseless. I have lived through much that was horrible in this life, but the ravaged town of Kweishu will always stand out in my mind as a symbol of war. Even so, I can only remember fleeting images, my mind unable to encompass the total vision. I remember the melted stone of Kweishu, vivid. Only in my dreams do I recall the twisted and blackened bodies that lay among those smoking ruins. The great stone walls, the huge stone temples and edifices, the spacious stone buildings with their rock courtyards and statuary. The large stone arena, all had melted, like butter on a hot summer day. The stone still smoldered, radiating heat, though it was obvious that the village had been attacked well over a sunrise ago. It was as if a white hot searing flame had, had engulfed the entire village. But what fire was there on Creek? It could melt rock. I remember a creaking sound. I remember hearing it and being puzzled by it and wondering what it was until locating the source of the odd creaking sound, the only sound in the deadly still town, became an obsession. I ran through the ruined village and then I remember shouting to the others until they came and all stood around staring. It was in the center of the melted arena. The huge stone blocks that poured down from the side of the bowl-shaped depression, pouring much ripples of rock at the bottom of the dish. And in the center was constructed a crude gibbet. Two stop posts had been driven into the ground by unspeakable force. Their bases splintered by the impact. Ten feet above the ground, a cross piece pole was lashed to the two posts. The wood was charred and blistered. Scavenger birds perched upon the top. Three chains made of iron that had melted and run together with the cause of the creaking sound, suspended from each chain. Apparently by the feet of the court, not human, not common. On the top of the gruesome structure was a shield stapled to the cross piece with a broken sword blade. And roughly clawed on that battered shield, the word written in a crude form of common speech. This is what happens to those who make prisoners against my will. Kill or be killed. It was signed Bernard. The name meant nothing to me. Other images. I remember Old Moon standing in the center of her father's ruined house, trying to put back together the pieces of a ruined base. I remember a dog, the only living thing in the entire village, curled around the body of a dead child. 
Caroline stopped to pet it. The animal, cringy, licked the big man's hand. It then licked the child's cold face, looking up at the warrior hopefully, expecting this human to make everything all right, to make his little playmate run and laugh again. Caroline <coughs> stroked the dog's soft fur in his huge hands. I remember the liver plane picking up a rock, holding it aimlessly as he stared around the garden and across the village. Then Sturm, standing transfixed before the gibbet, staring at the sun. I remember the night's lips moving as though in the prayer. I remember the sorrow-lined face of the dwarf who had seen so much tragedy in his long life, standing in the center of the ruined village. And I remember the dwarf putting his arm around Tasselhoff and patting him gently on the back when he found the Kendra sobbing in a corner. I searched, frantic for survivors. I crawled through the rubble, screaming out names, listening for faint answers screaming again until I was forced. River wind finally convinced me. I remember standing alone in the center of the town, looking at piles of dust with arrowheads in them, and recognizing them for bodies of draconians. A cold hand touched my arm, and the major's voice whispered, Dennis, we must leave. There is nothing more can do here, and we must reach Saksora. Then we will have our revenge. And so we left Weishu. We traveled far into the night, none of us wanting to stop, each wanting to push his body to the point of exhaustion so that when we finally slept, there would be no evil dreams. But the dreams come anyway. I can never forget Weishu. See it not always dark or light, but often both combine. The differences between disaster and success may suddenly rest on one man's shoulders, or perhaps the shoulders of a dwarf and a cat. Flint was shaking with the cold. His clothes were wet clear through. He began complaining about pains in his joints, and hands grew worried. He knew the dwarf was subject to rheumatism. And this was certainly no time to have a cripple on their hands. Tannis tapped the Kendra on the shoulder and drew him to one side. I know you've got something in one of your pouches that will take a chill off the dwarf's bones. If you know what I mean. Oh, sure, Tannis. Kasselhoff fumbled around, first in one pouch, then another, and finally came up with a gleaming silver flask. Brandy. Optic's finest. <laughs> I don't suppose you paid for it. Oh, I will. Next time I did. Sure, sure. Share some with Flint, but not too much. Just warm him up a little. All right, and we'll take the lead. We might be warriors. <laughs> Flint and Taz will hop range far ahead of the others. Taz soon forgot Tannis's warning about drinking only a little of the brandy. The liquid warmed the blood and took the edge off the gloomy atmosphere. So the Kendra and the dwarf passed the flask back and forth many times until it was empty. And they were tracing down the trail, making jokes about what they would do if they encountered the Tony. I turned it to stone, all right. Wham! Right in that lizard's gizzard. All that fresh one to turn one to stone with a single look. <laughs> I'll bet Caroline would stick a fork in one of you. Cass choked with laughter and had tears from his eyes. The dwarf roared. Suddenly, the two came to the end of the spongy ground. Tasselhoff grabbed hold of the dwarf as Flint nearly plunged head first into a vast pool of swamp water. It was so wide the divine bridge would not span it. A huge iron claw tree lay across the water, its thick trunk making a bridge wide enough for two people to walk across side by side. Now this is a bridge! No more spider crawling on those stupid green webs! Let's go! But shouldn't we wait for the others? Tannis wouldn't like us to get separated. Tannis, huh? We'll show him! All right, careful though, it's slick. Cass leaped up onto the fallen tree, slipping slightly, then easily catching his balance. He took a few quick steps, arms outstretched, his feet pointed outwards like a rope walker he'd seen once at the county fair. The dwarf clambered up after the candor, Flint's thick boots clumping along clumsily. 
A voice in the unbranding part of Flint's mind told him he could never have done this cold sober. <laughs> it also told him he was a fool crossing the bridge without waiting for the others. But he ignored it. He was feeling positively young again. Tasselhoff, enchanted with pretending he was Murgo the Magnificent, looked up to see that he did indeed have an audience. A draconian leaped onto the log in front of him. The sight sobered Tass up rapidly. The Kendra was not given to fear, but he was certainly amazed. Tass! Ambush! He slid his hands down to the bottom of his hoop pack stack, lifted it, and swung it in a wide arc. The move took the draconian completely by surprise. The creature sucked in its breath and jumped back off the log to the bank below. Tass, momentarily off balance, regained his feet quickly and wondered what to do next. He glanced around and saw another draconian on the bank. They were, he was puzzled to notice, not armed. Before he could consider this oddity, he heard a roar behind him. He had forgotten the dwarf. What is it? The Draco! Think of the jiggers! They're two ahead! Here they come! Well, confound it! Get out of the way! Where am I supposed to go? Duck! The Kendra duck, throwing himself down on the log as one of the draconians came toward him with clawed hands outstretched. Flint swung his axe in a mighty blow that would have decapitated the draconian if it had come anywhere near it. <laughs> The momentum of Flint's swing spun the dwarf around. His feet slipped on the slimy log, and with a loud oh. cry, the dwarf tumbled backwards into the water. <laughs> Tasselhoff had been around Raceland for years, and he recognized that the draconian was casting a magic spell. The Kender, <laughs> lying face down on the log, figured he had about one and a half seconds to decide what to do. The draconian was obviously coming to a stunning conclusion, not inches away from him. Deciding that anything was better than being magic, Tass took a deep breath and dove off the log, clutching his staff, hoping that all his pouches remained intact. Actions and their consequences. Now comes the knife. Now comes prison. Tass. The half-elf heard someone calling him from across a huge chasm. Then he felt an arm around his shoulder, <laughs> something him sit up. He opened his eyes. It was night. A huge fire blazed brightly somewhere, to judge by the light. Derm's face was near his, the night looking at him in concern. I'm all right. Where are we? Is everyone here? Anyone hurt? We're in a draconian camp. Hasselhoff and Flint are missing. Raceland's hurt. Badly? Uh, not good. Poison dart. Tennis got his first clear look at their prison. They were all being held in a cage made of bamboo. Draconian guards stood outside, their long, curved swords drawn and ready. Beyond the cage was the camp of the Draconians. Tennis could see what looked like hundreds of them milling around a campfire. And above the campfire... Yes, a dragon. More children's stories. Graceland would gloat. Graceland? Tennis went over to the mage who was lying in a corner of the cage, covered in his cloak. The young mage was feverish and shaking with chills. Caraman, his face nearly as pale as his brother sat beside him. Golden met Tennis's questioning gaze and shook her head sadly. She found this dart in his neck. Who can say what poison burns in his blood? We but had the stab. Right. Where is it? There. Jerm pointed. Tennis saw the stab. It was lying on Goldmoon's fur blanket in front of the black dragon, surrounded by hundreds of draconians. Reaching out, Tennis touched one of the bars of the cage. We could break out. Caraman would snap this like a twig. Tasseloff could snap it like a twig if he was here. Of course, then we've only got a few hundred of these creatures to take care of. Not to mention the dragon. <laughs> all right, all right. Any idea what happened to Flint and the Kinder? Riverwind said he heard a splash just after Tass yelled out we were being ambushed. If they were lucky, they dived off the log and escaped into the swamp. If not... Tannis closed his eyes to shut out the glaring firelight. He felt tired. He was tired of fighting, tired of killing, tired of slogging through the muck. He thought longingly of lying down and sinking back into sleep. Instead, he opened his eyes, stalked over to the cage, and rattled the bars. One of the draconian guards turned around, sword raised. You speak common? I speak common. Can't be better than you, Ellen Scum. <laughs> what do you want? One of our party is injured. We ask that you treat him. Give him an 
antidote to the poison dart. The antidote? <laughs> oh yeah, the magic user. Sick, is he? Yeah, the poison that quickly. Can't have a magic user around. He was behind bars, they are deadly. But don't worry, he won't be lonely wherever he's going in the afterlife. The rest of you will be joining him soon enough. In fact, you should envy him. Your death will not be nearly so quick. Tannis, <clears throat> feeling disgust and rage welling up deep inside of him, looked back at Raceland. The maze was growing rapidly worse. Goldmoon put her hand on Raceland's head, <coughs> feeling for the light feet, and then shook her head. Harriman, watching her with feverish eyes, made a low moaning sound. Then his glance shifted to the two draconians who were laughing and talking together outside. Stop, Caraman! Dennis yelled, but it was too late. No! Graceland will not die! The warrior leaped to his feet. Ah! Draconians. That move gave way before him. Caraman, you fool! Cutting into his skin. By this time, the draconians had whirled in alarm. Snarling, one raised his sword, but Caraman reached the creature first. The weapon went flying, and the draconian hit the ground, knocked senseless by a blow from the big man's fist. At that instant, the dragon spoke. Bring me the warrior! Several of the draconians rushed over and lifted Caraman up by the arm. They dragged him over to stand before the dragon, his back to the blazing fire. Caraman raised his head to confront the monster. My brother, he's dying. Do what you will to me. But I ask only one thing. Give me my sword that I may die fighting! <laughs> the dragon laughed shrilly. The draconians joined in, gurgling and croaking. Hardly. The dragon's wings beat the air and began to rock back and forth, seemingly prepared to leap on the warrior and devour him. It will be fun. Let him have his weapon. Caraman shoved the draconian guards aside. Wiping his hands across his eyes, he walked over to the pile of weapons and pulled out his sword. Then he turned to face the dragon, resignation and grief etched into his face. He lifted his weapon. We can't let him die out there by him. Sturm told Tannis. Suddenly a voice came from the shadows behind him. Tannis! What? Tannis glanced apprehensively at the Draconian guards. They were absorbed in watching the spectacle of Caraman and the dragon. Tannis hurried to the back of the bamboo cage where the dwarf stood. Get out of here! There's nothing you can do! Raceland's dying and the dragon is Tasselhoff! What? The dragon is Tasselhoff! The dragon's made of liquor. Tasselhoff sneaked behind it and looked inside. It's rigged. Anyone sitting inside the dragon can make the wings flap and speak through a hollow tube. I guess that's how the priests keep order around here. <laughs> anyway, Tasselhoff's the one flapping his wings and threatening to eat Caraman. What do we do? There's still a hundred dragons around. Sooner or later, they're going to realize what's going on. Get over to Caraman, you and Riverwind and Stern. <coughs> Grab your weapons and packs and a staff. I'll help Goldmoon carry Raceland into the woods. Tasselhoff's got something in mind. Just be ready. Oh. I don't like it any better than you. We're <laughs> <laughs> trusting our lives to that rattled brain tender. But, well, he is the dragon after all. Caraman <laughs> <laughs> stood there with his sword of rage. It flashed in the firelight. The dragon went into a wild frenzy, and all of the draconians fell back, brain spraying and clashing their swords against their shields. Wind from the dragon's beating wings blew up so much ashes and sparks from the fire that a few of the bamboo huts around the camp had small flames shooting from the grass covering. The draconians did not notice, so eager were they for the sight of the kill. The dragon shrieked and howled as Caraman felt his mouth go dry and his stomach muscles clench. It was the first time he had ever gone into battle without his brother. The thought made his heart draw painfully, and he was about to leap forward and attack when Tannis, Sturm, and Riverwind appeared out of nowhere to stand by his side. We will not let our friend die alone! <laughs> Get out of here, Tannis! This is my fight! Shut up and listen! Get your sword in mind! Sturm! Riverwind! Grab our weapons in the packs and any draconian weapons you can pick up to replace those we lost. Caraman, pick up the two stats. What? Tassel lost the dragon. There isn't time to explain. Just do as I said. Goldmoon's <laughs> <laughs> waiting. Go! Raceland's almost finished. This is your only chance. <laughs> <laughs>
This statement penetrated the fog in Karaman's mind. Stumbling almost blindly, he lurched over to the pile of weapons and grabbed the blue crystal staff. And now prepare to die, human! The dragon screamed. Its wings gave a great lurch, and suddenly the creature was airborne. The draconians croaked and cried out in alarm. Some broke for the woods, others hurled themselves flat on the ground. Now, run, Caraman! We'll cover you! Caraman reached the woods and found Rachel lying at Goldmoon's feet, barely breathing. Goldmoon grabbed the staff from Caraman and laid it on the mages in their body. Flint watched, shaking his head. It won't work. It's used up. It has to work. Please, please, whoever's master of this staff, heal this man, please. She repeated it over and over. Caraman watched for a moment, blinking his eyes. Graceland murmured. The big warrior knelt down beside his brother. Graceland was still pale, but his eyes were open and clear. He sat up and stared out at the raging fire. Then the woods around him were lit by a gigantic burst of flame. Name of the abyss. Would you look at that? Caraman turned just in time to see the great black wicker dragon crash headlong into the blazing bonfire. <laughs> the wicker dragon gave a final horrifying shriek. And then it too caught fire, its black body starting to glow orange. Castle off! That blasted Kendra, he's inside there! Before Caravan could stop him, the dwarf ran out into the blazing draconian camp. Hey, where's Pass that? In the dragon! Stern turned and saw the black wicker dragon burning with such intensity now that flames shot high into the air. Flint, it's no use. Nothing could live in that furnace. We've got to get back to the others. Castle off, Burfoot, you idiotic Kendra! Where are you? Tasselhoff, if you wreck this escape, I'll murder you! So help me! The dragon's head lay on the ground, still connected to the body by a long wicker neck some distance from the flaming body. The head had not caught fire yet, but the flames were starting to eat into the wicker neck. It was obviously only a matter of seconds before it too would be blazing. Stern saw movement. Flint, look! Stern ran toward the head, the dwarf pounding along behind. Two small legs encased in bright blue pants were sticking out of the dragon's mouth, kicking wildly. Cats, get out! The fire head's going to catch fire! Cats, stop! <laughs> Stern stared at the head feverishly, trying to figure out how to free the tender, while Flip grabbed hold of Cats' legs and pulled. No, Ow, stop! No good, he stuck fast. Flames <laughs> consumed the dragon's neck, devouring the wicker monster in an orange blade. Stern lifted his sword above the neck. Estimating the size of the candor, guessing where his head would be, and hoping his hands weren't stretched out over his head. Stern <laughs> held his sword above the dragon's neck, then took a deep breath and dropped his blade, crashing down on the dragon, severing the head from the neck. There was a cry <laughs> from the candor inside, but whether he was injured or just yelling, Stern couldn't tell. <laughs> Flint grabbed hold of the wicker head and pulled it away from the blazing neck. Suddenly, a tall, dark shape loomed out of the smoke. Stern whipped around, started ready, then saw it was Riverwind. The plainsman stared at the dragon's head. He looked at Flint and Stern, wondering if their ordeal had driven them mad. The Kendra's stuck in there! We can't take the head apart out here, surrounded by draconians. We've got to get out of here. His words were lost in a roar of flame, but Riverwind saw the blue legs sticking out of the dragon's mouth and grasped the situation. He ran over and grabbed hold of one side of the dragon's head, thrusting his hands in one of the eye sockets. Stern got hold of the other eye socket. Together they lifted the head with the kender inside and began running through the camp. <laughs> Those few draconians they encountered took one look at the terrifying apparition and fled. <laughs>
Remember the stars, Gaddis. The Queen of Darkness has returned. Recall the words of the Canticle. The swarm of her shrieking hosts. The hosts were dragons, according to the ancient ones. She has returned. And her hosts have come with her. This way, this home. At least it's dry. The food clutched at Rachel and pointing down a street branching off to the north of Saxarl. This section of town must have been the poorer part of the city, even in its glory days. The buildings were in the last stages of decay and collapse. The gully doors began whooping and hollering as they ran down the street. Germ looked at Tannis in alarm at the noise they were making. Can't you get them to be quieter so the bosses won't find us? <laughs> no bosses, they got some here. I'm afraid of the great eyeball. Tannis had his doubts about that. But glancing around, he couldn't see any signs of the draconian. That could have brought the group to a halt in front of one of the darkest, dingiest, filthiest alleys Tannis had ever seen. A foul mist flowed out of it. The buildings leaned over, holding each other up like drunks stumbling out of the tavern. Small, dark creatures skittered out of the alley as he watched. Gully dwarf children, spotting the dark shape, began chasing after them. Chitters! Those are rats! Oh, tasty! <laughs> have to go in there. Smell alone is enough to knock a troll dead. <laughs> then I'd rather die under a dragon's claw than have a gully dwarf hobble fall on top of me. Bahai <laughs> <laughs> Bahai! gestured down the alley, pointing to the most dilapidated building on the block. The other gully dwarfs nodded emphatically. Stay here and keep watch, you want. I'll go talk to the high bolt. No, we're in this together. They followed the alley, which ran several hundred feet to the east, then it twisted north and came suddenly to a dead end. Ahead of them was a decaying brick wall. Babu walked forward and knocked twice on the wall in front of them with her grubby fist. Secret door. I knock. Secret code knock. Five knock. That signal. Five knock. Now they let in. Nothing happened. <laughs> Disturbing the dragon. This, of course, didn't fit in with Fudge's plan. 
He therefore assumed he hadn't heard correctly. Cocooned in gaudy robes, he leaned back in the chipped gold leaf throne and repeated calmly, You hear, God sword, kill dragon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as our friend Bracelet explained, the dragon is guarding an object which belongs to our gods. We have, we are working on a plan to remove the object and escape the city before the dragon is aware that it's gone. How me know you not take our treasure? Big hype of only one man dragon. There <laughs> lots of presents. Pretty rocks. Two things. We'll bring you the pretty rocks. Help us, and you will get all the treasure. We only want to find this relic of our gods. It had become obvious to the high vault that he was dealing with thieves and liars, not the heroes he had expected. This group was apparently as frightened of the dragon as he was, and that gave the high vault an idea. He grinned to himself and wriggled around in his robes in excitement. Uh, what do you want from high vault? This gully dwarf, Buffu, told us that you were the only one in the city who could lead us to the dragon. Leave! Dragon. Leave! No! No leave! Great high vault, not a spellable! No! <laughs> Bracelet wakened in the cold gray hour before dawn, 
He had heard something. Sitting up, he tried to decide if he had been dreaming. No, there it was again, the sound of someone crying. The maid started to lay back down and return to sleep when he happened to see Baku curled in a ball of misery, blubbering into a blanket. Bracelet glanced around. The others were asleep. The maid stood up and headed softly over to where the gully dwarf had made her bed. Kneeling down beside her, he laid his frail hand on the dwarf's shoulder. What is it, little one? Baku started, then rolled over to face him. Her eyes were red, her nose swollen, tears streaked down her dirty face. She snuffled and wiped her hand across her nose. I don't want to leave you. I want to go with you. But, oh, I will miss my people. Sobbing, she buried her face in her hand. <coughs> a look of infinite tenderness and gentleness touched Rachel's face, a look no one in this world would ever see. He reached out and stroked Baku's coarse hair. He knew what it felt like to be weak and miserable, an object of ridicule and pity. Baku, you have been a good and true friend to me. You saved my life and the lives of, of those I care about. Now you must do one last thing for me, little one. Go back. I must travel roads that will be dark and dangerous before the end of my long journey. I cannot ask you to, to go with me. Abu lifted her head, her eyes brightening, then a shadow fell across her face. But you, you will be unhappy. No, no. My happiness will lie in knowing you are safely back with your people. You sure? I'm sure. Then I go find Hunter Fudge when to great. <laughs> she picked up her bag and slung it over her shoulder. <laughs> then she stopped and turned. That cop! <coughs> you sure you're not what? Lizard cure? No, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Babu looked at him sadly, then, greatly daring, she caught his hand in hers and kissed it swiftly. She turned away, her head bowed, weeping unable to leave. Graceland stepped forward. He laid his hand on her head. If I have any power at all, great one, power that has not been revealed to me as yet, grant that this little one goes through her life in peace. wide adoring eyes, then turned and ran off into the forest as fast as his floppy shoes could carry. What was that all about? Oh, so you got rid of your pet gully dwarf. Graceman did not answer. He simply stared at Flint with such malevolence in his golden eyes that the dwarf shivered and walked away early, shaking his head. Graceman sighed and turned, glancing out to the west toward his homeland. Suddenly he stiffened. And dropping his pack, he ran across the camp and knelt down beside the half-elf. Tennis, wake up! Tennis, startled by Raceland's tone of voice, woke instantly from his sleep and was immediately on his feet. Raceland pointed. Tennis stared, blinked, trying to focus his sleep-scummed eyes. He stared out west. The view from the top of the mountain where they were camped was magnificent. He could see the tall trees give way to the grassy plains. And beyond the plains, there... No! Thinking no. up... To the sky. No, it can't be. 